Kraft in einem anderen so Prayer, which day six in the monastic cell in which now we are, and five in the church in the community we are going to visit later. Four hours of manual work for study, meals consumed alone here in the cell, six to seven hours of sleep. Meals, communitarian meals only on Sundays and special feasts during the year. On Sundays, after Mass, we used to have one hour of meeting for the community in a special place we went to see later. And then once in a month, they had a walk out of the monastery to experience the life of their community together. All this said, you can immediately understand that this place here, the cell, the Carthusian cell, is the world of a Carthusian man, a monk. And he lives all his life here in this very special place. All this said, and understood that this is the cell there place where the monk, the Carthusian monk used to live all his daily life, we can say that this Carthusian cell was is the own world of a monk. And this is the reason why it is so big. They say that Le Corbusier, the famous French architect, uh, visiting this um, charter house, had the idea of the, the unité des habitations, the small houses for one family, visiting exactly this apartment of the Carthusian monk. And this is the reason why it is so big, because a man, a person, used to live here one, an entire life. So this is the study room, and the monks used to study, copy books, produce some new books, and so. And then this is the resting room, the room in which the monk used to sleep is six to seven hours a day. And we have to know that they used to stop their, um, their nights to wake up at half midday in, in, the, in the middle of the night and pray 45 minutes here in silence in the, in, the, in the study room and then together move and go in the church where we are going to see later. Three times during the day, the monk used to come here, open this door, and receive the meal from outside. And then put in again the plates here, and then close so that he could have his meal inside, as we have seen previously. The last uh, place, portion of this house of a Carthusian monk is the garden. And it is very important because during the day, they could have a moment of work or relax here in the garden. And then there were also some workshops here nearby. They could work manually and do their jobs. But we have to say that it was not, can say, a job that could produce money or um, richness. It was just a work in order to have a good life, because every human being needs time of work. Visiting this cell, I think we could think about, do we need places where to have moment with ourselves? In silence, reflecting, considering, listening to our soul, to our say, deep desires. So we can say that the Carthusian cell could be the example of the fact that every human life needs moments, periods, and situations in which we have to be alone with ourselves. Of course, the Carthusians were alone. They used to live in solitude, but their solitude, according to the faith, to the Christian faith, was inhabited by God. God speaks in the silence 
or the monk, and his voice can be heard in his holy word, word that is the Bible. And that's why the, the, the monk usually had to, used to spend a lot of time reading the Bible. We heard the, the bell, and we can say that the bell is very important in the life of a Carthusian monk because it, uh, it points the time. And the time is so important. I have to spend my time in a good and proper way. All the hours are so relevant and important. I cannot lose even half an hour of my life. And now we can move and visit the cloister, the, gra the great cloister, which is somehow the, the center of the Charter House. There is no other place in the Charter House than the great monk's cloister in which we now are, where we can feel and understand the secrets of the Carthusian life and the inspiration of Saint Bruno, the founder of the Carthusian monks, who lived the beginning of the second millennium. A quote from the statues of the Carthusian order can explain better the secret and deep spiritual identity of this place and this community living here. Blessed is the glory of the Lord, the Christ, word of the Father. For all times men were chosen by the Holy Spirit to lead a life of solitude and to unite them in an intimate love. Answering this calling, Master Bruno, year of the Lord, 1084, entered the desert of Chartres with six companions and began life there. The point is clear. A charter house is a desert, a place where to live a life of solitude, an intimate love with God, and one with the other. These two elements are very, very important. A place we have to be called to. It is something that must happen in your heart, you might receive the inspiration to look for this place, as Bruno experienced. And this secret invitation, the fact that I have been called to live here, is the keystone of everything here. Answering to a special call of God, Cartusians are witnesses of a particular will and initiative of God. The Christian God is a God who calls you and might ask you something that you could never imagine before, calling here you to live a life that is probably very special. And Cartusian's life, so that the decision of a person, of a man or a woman to live such a kind of life can be understood only in this way, just as a personal answer to a very particular and secret call of God. To perceive this, identify, listen, and obey to this voice is the long and complex process that leads a young person to enter the charter house and decide to live like this for all his life. Established 1,000 years ago, so a lot of time ago in the past. So we, we might say, oh, it is something old. No, pay attention because Master Bruno's style of life continues to be available for young persons of our age. This charter house now is no more the, the place where Carthusian monks live. But in Italy, we have two charter houses, one near Lucca and one in the south of Italy, in Calabria, and in that charter house, Serra San Bruno, there is the tomb of Master Bruno. And then we have also 22 more charter houses in the world, in three continents, more than 450 monks, men and women, living today this kind 
of contemplative life. Eighteen cells around the cloister, and then in the middle of the cloister, a very simple cemetery where the dead monks rest in communion with the still living ones. Because at the end, if you consider the secret of a Christian life, there is no separation between the living here and the dead, because we are all, can say, directed to the world of eternity in which everyone will live forever. In the corners of the great cloister here, one of the priors of the Carthusian community, Leonardo Bonafede, uh, asked the very famous uh, Florentine painter Jacopo Pontormo to paint five frescoes with the history of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. We are going to see these magnificent five frescoes at the end of our visit in the museum, in the Pinacoteca. A painted tale of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ that is somehow the key experience. So with Christ, in communion with Christ, every monk here used to experience this transformation and the experience that life is always wins over death. Living in the cloister here, we can follow the same path that the Carthusians used to pass through three times a day, coming out of their cells and one after the other, moving toward the church that is the second most important place of a charter house. The church where Carthusian monks used to live their communal experience of prayer. And if we could see, as we have seen at the beginning, the charter house from high on the sky, we could immediately see that the church here is in the center of the charter house. center, the spiritual center of the life of a Carthusian community, the church where the monks used to pray and celebrate mass and worshiping God is the very place where heaven and earth touch each other. And this is exactly the experience of the Christian liturgy. A worship and prayer that was sober and permixed with silence without musical instruments. Only voice, songs, psalms, all is projected to receive and enhance human voice in a very good way here in this hall. We could even sing. So it is a very good place where to pray and sing. We can imagine the Carthusian monks staying and sitting in the magnificent wooden choir in the dialogue of a prayer that used to foster also their communal love and their life here. And behind the altar, there is the glory of Master Bruno, the dead of Master Bruno and his arrival in heaven, where Christ receives him, since he has really reached the happiness, the gaudium, the joy, the fullness of joy of a very good life. <laughs>
Near the church, we can find the other rooms where the monks used to spend the rest of the communal moments of life. And this is the cloister that can be considered the, the crucial point from where every day the monk used to pass, coming from the great cloister, entering the church. And this is also the point of connection to other three rooms. The refectory, where they used to have their meal on Sundays and feast days. The room for confessions. And then another very important room, the chapter house, you can get inside, where the monks used to gather and have their meetings, discussion, where to take new decisions, receiving new monks, or electing the new prior of the community, the leaders, or they can say the responsible of the community. Few words can be said about this room, the chapter house, because um, the way in which a religious community um, takes his decisions, discuss about new arguments, can be seen as a very important, you can say, method, model for our processes of decision in a family when we discuss, when we have to take a decision where to go for, for example, for vacations or even more serious decisions about where to go to study, what good job can look for, and so we, we need to be ready to listen one to the other and to respect the various ideas and to consider all the various elements. That's why this room has been very important. We could be here listening to the monks discussing and exactly uh, say receiving a, a good teaching from them. In the very middle of the, of the room, there is the tomb of a prior of the, of the uh, charter house, Leonardo Buonafede, who then became a bishop, bishop of Cortona in Tuscany. And he is very important because he has been the one who managed to transform this uh, charter house from the medieval, ancient, old structure to the wonderful, magnificent Renaissance style we are now, we have now in front of us. The silent and separated life that Carthusians monks were able to live, we have experienced, we have understood, needed, of course, a continued help and support. And this was and continued to be the task of a second group of men, the lay brethren, who devout their lives in this specific service, taking care of the entire complex here, preparing meals every day, working in the fields around. You can imagine that in order to protect the silence, the solitude of monks, in order to build a new charter house, there, was, there had to be the, so the, the fact that all the fields around could be empty, uh, so on the property of the charter house. So working in the fields, producing wine, oil, many other products of the land, and then also we can also today taste the delicious spirits prepared with secret and still working recipes here in the shop of the charter house. Lay Bretter had also their own rooms. This is the cloister of the lay brethren. And they could enter the church from that side, and they had their own, own specific portion of the church in which they could stay sharing the prayer of the monks.
cannot end our visit to the Charter House of Florence without uh, visiting and meeting the man, the person who gave life to this magnificent complex full of art, beauty, spirituality, prayer. And we are exactly now in front of his tomb, the monument he decided to have for himself where he lays since his death, November 8, 1365. Niccolò Acciaiuoli had a relatively short life, full of incredible enterprises and astonishingly rich. He got a very huge richness. I don't know if Donald Trump was so rich as he was. He became famous and powerful in Naples, at the court of Angevins, where he was sent when he was really young, up to 20 years old, by his father, Acciaiolo, who is buried here, to take care of the affairs of his family that was one of the merchant families of Florence, very rich. He became Duke of Athens, great seneschal of the kingdom and viceroy of Apulia, Puglia. Following the example of the kings of Naples, who had been founder of various charter houses in the south of Italy, Niccolò decided to join the memory of him, of his name, with the building of an important new charter house near Florence, this one. The project started 1342 and managed to be accomplished in few years, and Niccolò could see the complex established and built. And he wanted, we can read letters and documents in which he clearly expresses the will of being buried in the in one of the chapels of the Charter House of Galluzzo of Florence. So Niccolo was so joined with this Charter House here in Florence, his name was so joined with this place so that he had a particular moment of, the, of his life decided that he would like to spend the last part of his life here. And that's why he, he projected and he built a big palace, this palace, Palazzo Acciaiuoli, where he really expected to spend the rest of his life. By the way, we have to say that the Certosa, the Grand Charter House of Florence, had the name, has the name of St. Lawrence uh, in the memory of one of the sons of Niccolò who died very young. Um, of course, Niccolò had this project, but then finally he died um, untimely, too, too early at the, at the age of 55, 56, so he could not uh, finally do this. And then in the second, in the second moment, he also had the idea to use this palace of a, as a college of study for Florentine students to come here and study. And this now, this upper room of the palace, has become the museum of the um, Charter House. And here we can see the five frescoes of Jacopo Contorno that had been painted in the period while there was uh, the leper uh, in Florence, 50, 1522 up to 1523, a period not so different from the pandemia period that we are now living. So it is very interesting also from this point of view. And the five frescoes, as you see, uh, tail the various steps of the passion process, trial of Jesus. He is uh, arriving on the, on the mountain, the crucifixion, the deposition of his body, and in the middle, resurrection. Few words must be said at the end of our visit. As you have understood, 
today this charter house is no more the house of Carthusian monks. The last Carthusian monks uh, left the, this charter house of Florence uh, at the end of the, uh, 1950, the 50s of the last century and moved to the charter house near Lucca, Farneta. And then after that, we had here 60 years of the presence of Benedictine monks Cistercensi from an abbey near Rome, uh, near Frosinone, Casamari. And then they finally left again after 60 years. And since three years, the community I belong to, the Comunità di San Leolino, has accepted the challenge, uh, the, the, the request of the Bishop of Florence to take care of this place and to try to, can say, bring on the beauty and the richness and the symbol that this place is. Of course, with a different use. Uh, we have now started using this place with musical concerts, meetings, uh, moments of reflection, spiritual life, of course. So opening this closed garden of the charter house and let it live a new life, can say a third life. But of course, and this is maybe the most important point as we have seen visiting the, the charter house, this place had been projected exactly to help the spiritual life of the Carthusian monks. A huge and complex architecture architecture at the service of a spiritual project, shaped, exactly shaped according to the needs of the monks, the cell, the big cloister, the various rooms, the church in the middle. And this can be an, interest opportun an interesting opportunity to reflect on how important for every one of us can be the fact that we might have good, proper spaces and rooms where to live, study, work. And this architecture, this beauty, can really help us in living and experiencing and bringing on a good life. We could say, as a final word of this visit, show me where you live, where you study, where you work, where you pray, where you love, and I could tell you who you are. One way.